I'm Kevin Libwit, joined by Andrew Page. We're both from Fijian, and this is the Bioinformatics Lab podcast. Today, we're hey. talking about will we be replaced by AI robots? Andrew, I'll give you the first word. Yeah, I'm technically a robot right now. You know, this isn't me. This cardboard cut out, and I'm just saying things based on what Kevin has just said, you know? And so, yeah, maybe I'm not here at all. What Obviously, that's not true, but... It's really crazy if you look at um, certain creative industries, like people who are extras. I heard that, uh, you know, some extras are being paid an extra $200 to be allowed to have their um, bodies and voices, you know, forevermore to be included with, you know, generated as AI and put into movies and stuff. And it's like, Jesus, that's crazy. Like you could do away with an entire industry of extras. You know, you could sell your soul for a few hundred dollars and that's it. You know, then your image is gone you know that's it they'll just copy and paste I, don't know I don't know if you're following the u.s but there's a huge writers and uh actor strike in hollywood and that's cited as one of those items of like how oh will God. we do we have a framework for people to continuously be uh you know paid for their likeness in, in these movies and things like that yeah it, it, it diminishes the need for any sort of extras in the back and okay in that sort of hypothetical of you being a virtual AI as is, as it stands today. What the kind of crazy part of it is, I would have little idea, right? Like you and I have met maybe in person once, right? And now we've been working together over months and I only have your virtual profile to base my reality and understanding of you, right? So it is kind of wild to watch these technologies, especially the sort of uh, text to video and then these sort of... Um, overlays ai overlays of people uh, mm. because and then the voice thing the voice thing i think you've already done a number of times with your podcast it's getting there it's not it doesn't feel too far off yeah like um th like there's a whole industry of people who do voiceovers like voiceover artists and you can see it on fiverr and uh and uh, websites like that where you get voiceovers for anything but that's being you know gradually you know well not gradually but in one you know year is going to be wiped out as an industry because people are having their voices cloned and then why would you hire a voiceover artist if you can just go back to your back catalog copy their voice and then you know put it into like 11 labs or whatever and have a cloned voice you just type stuff out and then they read it out i mean that's just insane there's a lot of ethical implications here you know for this replacement some industries are just going to be absolutely decimated overnight okay in last episode you and i were talking about where the technology is right now and how you still need some sort of expert's eye to comb over things. But as the technology progresses, presumably there's going to be a time where you don't need that expert eye on things. And it's like, at a certain point, you have that person who's using these software. It's like, wow, every time I check this thing, it's, it's right. And maybe they get, they figure out the citations and that whole conversation of validating truth. And it's able to cite that every single time. And it's like, at a certain point, we're just going to start trusting it. Right. So like in your eyes, in terms of if you had the this sort of future prediction, what kind of timeline does that look like? Are we talking about 10 years, 20 years, 30 years where it's like, well, this, no. it's getting this thing. Or what do you think? I, I think that the field is changing so quick. Like it's, it's literally every week is something new in AI. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's this year it's just exploded. So I don't think we can predict any timelines because it's just going so fast. Uh, what we might have is different models actually um, supervising other models. You know, it might you know it might be maybe Claude is keeping an eye on ChatGPT and uh, and whatnot, and that maybe that's the way to go, or maybe humans are like the people who sit in you know, like security guards with a wall of screens in front of them. You know, like just monitoring what the the AI is doing, robots are doing, and uh, we're just reduced to like slightly more intelligent AI. <laughs> slightly less intelligent AI. I like that. And, and I'm, I'm so fascinated to see how the role of the bioinformatics scientists will change in the laboratory. And I, I think about it even in the context of just like layers of abstraction, because even whenever I'm doing like sort of software development, I feel like I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder because I was introduced to things at, like, at Python. It was always human readable. I can always read something and assess what's going on. Um, without too much confusion. Whereas like, you know, I have maybe friends who are proper CS majors and they're, they're coding in like a language I can't read. I don't have no idea. They're talking about moving bytes of memory and things like this. Um, 
but there was a light layer of abstraction with Python. I didn't have to think about anything like that. And when I look at GPT, it's just another huge layer of abstraction on top of that, where I don't even have to know, or maybe in the future, you wouldn't even need to know anything about programming or anything about uh, those, those finer details. It's more about the prompt engineering. How well can I ask this question with the tool that I'm using uh, to ensure I get to um, the endpoint? But again, at that point, it's just natural language you're using, uh, which seems like the direction we were trying to get to of all the different iterations of, of useful languages. Now this one, instead of you know Python blocks and classes and all these things, I'm just using sentences and paragraphs. Yeah, it is kind of weird. Um, and particularly there, well, I was going to say low paid uh, professions, you know, are most at risk, but actually possibly not because there are mm -hmm. people actually have to do things, you know, and, and uh, it's the high value professions currently who are probably most at risk of having to change how they work. If you think about it, you know, like anyone who's a computer, you know, now will probably have to adapt uh, and change what they're doing, how they're working, in what way they're working. And if you don't adapt, well, then you're going to have to change your role, probably. Um, uh, which is kind of weird because historically it has been said so low paid professions, you know, have been the ones who are, are, you know, out of a job. So I don't know when cars came along, you know, people who were, you know, keeping taking care of horses, you know, found that they're out of jobs, you know, because less people needed horses and whatever. Obviously, it took decades and whatever to happen, but it happened nonetheless. Um, but yeah, it's going to change a lot of things. Well, maybe the the creative industries might be the first ones really feel the brunt of it because like if you look at um like the logo for this podcast was made using Dali you know an AI generated thing and you just typed in a bit of text and then bang there you go uh whereas oh, previously yeah. you know we, we probably would have paid on a hundred dollars or whatever to get a get someone to knock something up yeah that, and, and I'm trying to think in terms of like the bioinformatics space, it's hard for me to use that language of like, we will be replaced by AI. Maybe they, of course, obviously biased and I don't want to be replaced by robots. Um, but I also feel as if there's such a shortage of people with the bioinformatics skill set, it's not so much that we'll be replaced, but I think laboratories will turn to, um, we, we may not just need as many as we currently need because we can extend the functionality of the few people who kind of got attracted to the field in general. Maybe that's a sort of glass half full kind of perspective, but I think the the more people learning bioinformatics and being expert in the field is, is already a small pool. Uh, but then to and and the need is so great in terms of just how much data is being generated at all different industries. I mean, obviously we come from pathogen genomics, microbial genomics, but you know uh, the worlds of you know environmental sciences, um, just microbiome studies all over the world in the different industries that that might even impact from crop agriculture to oil and gas and everything where that's relevant. Um, there's such a neat, there's so much data being generated. We're seeing sort of an explosion of sequencing platforms coming out um, at, at, at present as well. So there's, there's only more room for more bioinformatics capabilities. And it's just maybe because I've never seen it, but, and this does happen in certain fields, but there's just such a shortage of talent that, there's not a conversation of replacing. We still need this, these many people and we just need to extend their capabilities further. And that's where these kinds of technologies help to meet that demand uh, that we're kind of in right now for lack of bioinformatics capabilities. I think, uh, you know, over the past few years and I've been in bioinformatics, the amount of data produced is just, you know, grows exponentially every, every yeah. few years. It's just phenomenal. And I don't think that's going to go away. Well, what we'll probably have with AI is even more data, you know, like the paperless office was touted back in the 70s. And yet we what we had actually was the, you know, overflowing paper office. You know, there's even more paper generated over and over again. Um, and it was decades before we even got to, you know, the inflection point where it started going down. So I think we're probably going to have even more data to analyze and we're going to do better things quicker um, so I think most of us are safe. Some of us will have to retrain and learn how to do things differently, which will upset some people because some people don't like change. Um, but, you know, you do have to change. This is we're in a bleeding edge of science, like quite literally the bleeding edge. And I, I want to see, um, like, say, genome sequencing in every single doctor's surgery, you know, in the world. And, you know, when you walk in, I, I what I want is you know, take a swab or a blood test and then 10 minutes later to tell you, oh, you've got this and here's the drug that you can have. You know, we know that this will be the most effective drug for you. 
And could you imagine like the, the revolution that will bring to, to people's lives? Yeah, and, and that's the future we're walking into with these kinds of technologies. You can you can make you can code those resources all that much more um, robustly and quickly, and then distribute them and scale, and then figure out ways to scale them. And, and so, yeah, you you add so many different skill sets to your current bioinformatics scientists, especially a lot of us. You know, we came from the wet lab and we learned the CS, and we have enough competence of the CS to understand how we can use these resources to again bolster what we know about the field. And so when I look at that, again, that framing of that original question of will we be replaced by AI, I think a lot of our skill sets will be, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see. Um, I even look at it even through my career so far where, you know, in the very beginning, I had to know exactly how to install tools locally, where that skill set got replaced by understanding how to use package managers. And then that got kind of replaced by to using Docker images and being able to port those and, and write those kinds of files. And in the same way, I think, whereas uh, maybe the skill set right now is understanding the nuances of a lot of different uh, scripting languages, that gets replaced by understanding how to use VS Code to write a really clarified comment uh, to help to allow it to, to write a some kind of function or a class for me and then be able to assess it. Um, yeah, and, and I think we talked about this maybe on our first episode too. We, we come from a unique perspective where we're watching both sides of the fence. It's kind of like we, we, we were before AI integration and then after, so we get that full perspective of things. It's going to be very interesting in the next three, five years where there's going to be uh, bioinformatics practitioners who were born with this in their hands. You know, they, they, they started mm -hmm. with... Um, with GPT AI and you know uh, Copilot, to, so I don't know what 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 is your prediction in, in a bioinformatics course in five years? Whereas you know now we're talking about um, learning Python or something like that and going through like the Roslyn exercises of conferring. That seems as if there won't be that need to necessarily start there. How would you design a course in five years of introduction of bioinformatics? Well, I mean, I just seen the uh, some of the computer science courses that are taught to uh, secondary school students here, high school students, mm. and I'm appalled because they're still teaching like Fortran and ah. I'm like, Jesus Christ, and uh, you know Fortran like pseudocode, and it's like, yeah, th these things move a lot slower than we think because you know we're we're so involved and so invested in it, and we forget that actually courses you know might be made ten years ago based on stuff that's twenty years old. Um, so I think bioinformatics course in five years, please God, they will actually have some modern stuff in there. And uh, hopefully there'll be a lot of, uh, rather than, you know, being allergic to AI tools, they'll actually embrace them and really uh, try and use them to the full. But if, yeah. if I look back at, a, at my recent career, you know, uh, same bioinformatics, we used to have someone um, full time just installing software on a cluster. Um, for bioinformatics tools, for microbial bioinformatics. Like, that's insane, you know, when you think about it now with Conda and Docker. And then we we had, uh, like, a team of finishers. Uh, like, so P you do, do the de novo assembly, and then they were the people who would manually overlay, uh, you know, find overlapping reads and, you know, kind of bring everything together. And that's an entire industry that's totally gone as well. Um, people don't finish genomes because we have like nanopore and whatever, uh, you know, for, for doing this in high throughput and pack bio. Um, so things do change rapidly and people adapt. And I think this will just be another case of people adapting. Yeah. When you describe that, I, of uh, having a full-time employee dedicated to installing software, I mean, that reminds me of the people who are, you know, watching after the horses, <laughs> whatever the, the, the car came about. But I, I'd imagine in your case and those particular people, they, they adapted and learned the next skill set. Like you free their time up to open them up to, to employing more creativity in, in the skill set of bioinformatics. And then getting back to the, the university or educational model, I think this is definitely forcing some modernization happening, right? Even in the conversation of just, uh, you know, essay writing and, and homework assignments and things like that, they have to adapt to this. And then so in adapting to uh, the, the current technologies, hopefully there's a conversation of adapting the curriculum to be able to incorporate these types of things. And then on that side, you know, kind of does 
flirt with the conversation of the ethical considerations. We were already kind of mentioning that the homework assignment things and, and being able to turn assignment, you know, I can write an essay on, you know, Moby Dick in the style of William Shakespeare, and I can be done before we upload this podcast. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah. and, and, and home with a beer. Exactly. And you've thought quite a bit about this. I think uh, of the ethical considerations, written a couple uh, papers and, and podcasts on this subject, but how does that change things as, as people adopt these AI resources in, in uh, replacing a lot of what they would have done manually? What are the ethical considerations to keep at the forefront of our minds here? Well, I mean, plagiarism is a huge one, you know, are you plagiarizing someone else's work and then the robot is just, or the AI is just regurgitating things? Um, because, you know, someone originally had to do some work to, you know, come up with that to feed into the AI, be it William Shakespeare or whatever. Um, and if that person happens to be making a living right now, then that that's a problem, you know, because you're ripping off their stuff. Um so yeah, plagiarism is a huge, huge thing. And then, you know, who owns the intellectual property? If an AI is, you know, gone and generated something, does the company that wrote the model, you know, uh, mm. you know own it? Uh, is it the the AI itself, you know, as, as a person? Or is it the person you typed in the prompt? You know, like there there is issues that we don't really know the answers to. And what you know if ChatGPT produces some code who owns the you know what license is it released under who owns it um we don't really know and is it just because you have typed in the prompt that you are the person who gets to decide the license and you know release it under gpl or whatever we don't know these answers so a lot of ethical things to be worked out the code ownership is such an interesting one because you if, if you prompted it and you use the tool to uh, generate that code, do you then own it? And I think this um, came to a head most uh, notably in even like the, the arts world, again, the creative spaces where I think there was some kind of digital art. Uh, I'm speaking of sparse memory here, but I think there was some kind of digital art competition or something like this. And the awarded winner, it came out that they were using AI generative tools to create their piece. And it was like, well, I mean, I, th this was my paintbrush, you know? So that was sort of the argument. Like you guys use your digital paintbrushes. I use the prompt to generate this thing. And maybe there's a conversation to be made of, of to, you know, steel man that argument that they were the one to, to, to tweak the prompt itself. And that's what resulted in the tool. Um, but I think, yeah, it gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, and, and maybe it's just such easier for us to wrap our minds around in the, the art world because there's a little bit more history and in historical narrative regarding those copyrights of um, creative works, whenever, you know, if you have an image maybe from Dali and it looks exactly like one other person's type of work, you can even tell it to, right? You could say like in the style of Norman Rockwell or something like that, and it'll get it in that, to the, it'll embody the spirit of Norman Rockwell. It gets to a really interesting conversation of um, attribution and, and credit uh, along the lines there. But then even uh, falsifying information as well or hallucinating in, in different ways, that can cause a lot of problems, say, in the art world where you maybe fake pictures. You know, photoshopping suddenly becomes a lot harder to detect. Um, Elizabeth Bick, I know, was uh, has been looking at oh. images with AI tools and uh, rather than just manually looking at them as well. And then finding, you know, here's a bit of an image here in one paper. And then a few years later, the same bit is in another paper. And it's like, how the hell did that happen? You know, clearly someone's copied from someone. And it's probably the second paper, you know, say with no authors in common um, that, that's been doing it. And it's only the use of AI being able to kind of look at these things en masse and say, actually, this and this are the same thing. And um, that you realize, hang on a second, there's a lot of, you know, maybe low level dodgy stuff going on, people taking shortcuts they shouldn't take. Um, or say in acad academia or mathematics, you know, people trying to maybe game a particular metric, you know, met metrics are always there for, for gaming, unfortunately, you know, trying to game. Uh, I know some countries uh, provide funding based on the number of papers you get, mm. uh, whether good or bad or indifferent, you know, it's a, a bar to reach or, you know, people put in silly incentives or whatever. So it, it is quite quite an interesting thing. And AI, it's not going to replace us all, but it will certainly make our lives better, I think. Agreed completely. And, and uh, re replace a lot of the things that we have to focus on, because we, we've never really had to have these considerations 
uh, whenever we're, we're putting these kinds of materials out together. So it's, it's replacing a lot of what is now priority and what we're putting our time towards. I, will it replace people completely? I don't think so. I have a, you know, a bias and optimism to the human spirit and creativity that I don't, that I don't at this point think is fully captured uh, by LLMs. You know, again, that, that route to full uh, general artificial general intelligence, maybe we're having a different conversation. That feels far out still. It feels like there's still a number of leaps in uh, both even just compute power and theoretical models uh, before we get there. But right now, it seems like an incredible tool uh, to, to, again, expand or ex uh, extend the functionality of your bioinformatics practitioners in lab.